Hi, and thank you for joining us right here at Breast Cancer Answers. You know, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and we've got something really cool that we want to talk with you about today. We just went through, my wife and I, Wendy, went through the um, this very question, do we really need chemotherapy? It was just a matter of 60 or 75 days ago, and we want to bring you in to what our experience is, share with you what we've learned, and we want to do that to help elevate everybody's you know, overall health experience. So joining me on, on today's program is Dr. Jay Harness. He's our medical director and past president of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Hi, Dr. Harness. Hey, good morning, Todd. It's a good morning. Good to be with you. Good time to talk about, hey, do I need chemotherapy? You know, it's a huge question. We struggled with it. We being Wendy Hartley and me. Good morning, Wendy. Good morning. Grateful it's, to be here. It's so silly that I say good morning to you because I woke up next to you and now I'm saying it again. You can say Perfect. it all, all morning if you like. Perfect. So, um, so to let you in on what Wendy and I experienced, we're going to share the story, we're going to talk with Jay, but I want you to know that this was the most difficult question and moment of our entire cancer journey. Wendy, take us to that last couple of days of what was going through your mind as we were trying to determine do we really need chemotherapy? Well, I remember just having surgery and having two lymph nodes positive and my breast surgeon wanted to install a port and I hadn't seen my medical oncologist yet so I assumed I was going right into chemotherapy and when I met with my medical oncologist he said that I'm a candidate for the Oncotype DX test that will give a recurrent score of my tumor to see if my how aggressive my cancer is and if I do need chemo so I felt that I was really fortunate to be in this to be a candidate to take this test not only did it allow me to buy some healing time because I wasn't ready to start chemotherapy my body hadn't even healed yet from my double mastectomy and uh, and it just there there was that that time of just building hope that I might not need it and it just allowed me to you know get some rest and healing time in before the next chapter was decided you know it's uh, it was it was scary for us and I think we were on our breaking point dr. Harness tell us <laughs> about the oncotype DX test provide a little history and an overview on what it provides for patients well, first of all, it's a 21 gene analysis of the tumor itself, Todd. Now, this is different than doing gene testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2. This is actually taking a piece of the tumor, sending it off to Genomic Health, where they do a special test and get a gene profile, and then out of that, get a recurrence score from 0 to 100. And the different kinds of recurrence scores you can get are low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And what we've learned from this test now over several years is that if you end up in the low risk category, you, you not only don't need chemotherapy, but you actually don't benefit from it. Conversely, if you end up with a high risk recurrence score, then you really do need chemotherapy, you benefit from it, but you'll also get the anti-hormone uh, therapy. And in Wendy's case, that's a a medicine called uh, a medication called tamoxifen. Wendy, why are you clapping? Because and just the time that we're living in, and just to have all these medical researchers and science to be able to aid your course, and to to not have to go from one surgery into chemotherapy, and it you know to to be able to score low, and be able to have that that confidence that I don't need it. Yeah, as, as you recall, Wendy, you and Todd and I obviously talked very, very frequently during the first several weeks of your diagnosis and initial treatment. And uh, well, well th you know, it was, listen, it was my honor to do it. But one of the things was that you had been recommended to have your port put in. And our viewers may not even know what a port catheter is, and I may be able to explain that. But uh, when you have uh, a port put in, that means, hey, I'm absolutely on my way to getting chemotherapy. Now, as a guy who's been at this for 28 years, uh, I got to tell you, I've rarely met a pa I've rarely met a patient 
who comes in uh, uh, asking for chemotherapy. It's singularly one of the most frightening things that um, people uh, have in their minds. I remember uh, asking you because we had a wedding to go to September 15th and that would have been the time that if I had to start it asking you if I can put it off for 30 days just so we can enjoy going to a wedding. Right, uh, yeah absolutely and remember what I said to you I said look I know you have two microscopically positive lymph nodes time out. I want to know even though you're in your 40s and microscopically you've got two lymph nodes positive I want to know what your Oncotype DX score is because remember you had an intermediate grade cancer which is the, the more common of you know it's sort of a bell-shaped curve and you were right in the middle and you were strongly estrogen and progesterone receptor positive and I really wanted to know the results of your Oncotype now, conversely, had you come back, Wendy, with a high intermediate score or high score, high risk score, then we would have said, okay, guess what? I really do need the chemotherapy. And it would have affirmed that. But historically, your age group, two microscopically positive lymph nodes, if you asked 100 medical oncologists, I think a vast, vast majority of them say automatically you're getting chemotherapy. So are we seeing a period now, Dr. Harness, where the, um, the, the cancer community is recognizing that we've been over-treating patients with chemotherapy and now they're taking a more systematic or scientific approach on who needs it and who doesn't? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Todd. It's an excellent question. And his historically, we have relied on things like tumor size, lymph node positivity, we've relied on things like uh, uh, age of the patient, just, just a variety of things. And, um, uh, and, and those have been the historic criteria, if you will, that you're going to get chemotherapy. Now fortunately, over the last oh, five years or more, we've headed into getting additional data. And this data is the genomic profiles of cancers. Um, I've said repeatedly to my patients, breast cancer is a galaxy of diseases from very, very benign acting to super aggressive acting. The genetic or uh, genomic profiles, if you will, start to give us fingerprints of the individual cancers and what we're trying to do then is to personalize the therapy to the individual fingerprints. And this will become a lot more sophisticated in the next five, eight, ten years where all of the therapies in the future, in my view, will be targeted at what the individual fingerprints of an individual cancer is. It's amazing. It's excellent. Yep. yep. So let me explain what a portocatheter is, okay? Jeez, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Wendy, as you may or may not know, most chemotherapy is given intravenously. And, you know, if that means somebody's going to stick you in the arm every time you come in, your poor veins get worn out. These drugs can be somewhat toxic to the veins. So a portocatheter is a thin uh, tubing, if you will, attached to a reservoir. And generally, the reservoir can be put right underneath the skin here on the chest wall, usually on the opposite side from where the cancer is. And so that either by feel or with a little magnet, you know where the, the plastic uh, point is and a needle can be put into it and they can infuse the chemotherapy through the port, use it over and over again. Uh, the port can also be put down in the arm as well. Uh, it is another little operation to put it in. And you know, if you're going to be on chemotherapy in some cases for a year, where you get uh, initial chemotherapy in the HER2 new positive patients and then you're going to be getting Herceptin every three weeks. Having something like this in is much less pain, easy, uh, you don't you know, use up all the peripheral veins, etc. Dr. Harness, that was, a, uh, that was a really interesting explanation. I've never heard that before. Uh, the, is the breast surgeon typically the one who installs the portocatheter? Yeah, the breast surgeon can. Uh, most of us are trained as general surgeons, so we can put them in. 
The other group that puts them in, Todd, are called interventional radiologists. These are, are uh, radiologists whose whole deal is doing interventions, putting things, putting catheters in people, draining fluid out of people, uh, doing needle biopsies, uh, etc. But often the breast surgeon is also the one who will put the porta catheter in. Uh, it's usually done under local anesthetic, could be done at the same time as the initial breast surgery, breast cancer surgery, or done at a separate time. But what I really wanted to do, and what I want to encourage uh, people uh, that we're dealing with, that are viewers today, uh, is to, hey, have all of the facts before you make that next step of having a porta catheter put in. You mentioned something earlier that Wendy and I experienced, that we're in this era of personalized treatment, and it's based on genetic, genomic profilings, right? And, um, and so that genomic profiling helps determine who benefits from chemotherapy. Is that, a, is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, it does, Todd. And what it's doing, what the genomic profiling is doing, and there are other uh, tests out there besides uh, Oncotype, but what the uh, genomic profiling is doing is uh, it's um, uh, helping us to um, uh, determine the biology, if you will. In other words, you've got biology that's variable from patient to patient, and tumor to tumor, and it helps sort things out. Uh, it get, let me give you a good example of this. Uh, about not six, nine months ago, maybe it's a little bit longer than this, the National Cancer Institute uh, put out a paper uh, called a Genomic Atlas, in other words, like a roadmap, if you will. And this uh, Genomic Atlas was drilling down in these gene subtypes and of 800 patients that were uh, outlined in this particular paper, there were like 30,000 gene mutations for crying out loud, okay? Wow. So, as I said, we're going to get more specific, you know, as we, uh, as we go along here, and that's going to be a huge part of the future. I have to apologize. I'm at home right now. And you may hear in the background the garbage people are here. So <laughs> that's all right. We, we made the decision today to bring the puppy to the office because it was so hard to leave him this morning. And so I think Wendy just got up to go get the puppy out of some trouble, which is a, you know, it's a full-time job. Yeah. So Dr. Harness, um, we spend some time talking about how patients determine that they don't need chemo. Let's talk about the benefits of chemo what that experience, um, what, this, what the cycles are like, what's that, what that's called, and how chemo is different today from when you got started 29 years ago. So you're 29 years, aren't you? Yeah, 28, 29, give, it, give or take a year, a year here or there, no problem. Yeah, um, uh, Todd... We've known for well over 30 years now that with um, invasive breast cancers, and what that what that means is can the cancer the uh, cancer is growing through the cancer is growing through the walls of the ducts. Okay, let me let me hold on for a second while Wendy's getting readjusted here. Sorry, I had to step out. That's okay, yeah. honey. We talked about the dog. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Very good. He's my anxiety soother. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's also your 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 child, so it's great. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to listen? Um, so Wendy, Doctor Harness is talking about. Hey, Happy, welcome to the show, man. <laughs> Doctor Harness is talking about chemotherapy and and who benefits from it, and also the historical overview of the thirty years. Yeah, we, we've known, Todd, for, for 30 years that if a cancer is invasive, that means it's growing through the walls of the ducts, and therefore you can shed off cancer cells that go elsewhere in the body, that you have to treat the whole body. So there are fundamentally two ways of treating the whole body, and, and, and in many patients we use both ways. A one way is chemotherapy, which is obviously if you give intravenous chemotherapy, it's circulating throughout the body, 
and therefore it can go to places like the liver, like the bones, like the lungs, other places to potentially kill off any cancer cells that have shed off and gone, gone, gone elsewhere uh, in the body. Uh, one of the problems we've got, Todd and Wendy, is that the chemo, many of the chemotherapies do not cross what's called the blood-brain barrier, mm. meaning we have this barrier, if you will, physiologic barrier that protects keeping certain things from getting to our brain. And I, I won't go into the science of all this, but Thank that, you. that's one. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I want to know. We'll do it on hair. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They can Espe go to sleep. <laughs> especially early in the morning. If people don't want to. They, all they care about is caffeine getting to their brain right, right now. Right, right. right. <laughs> right. I've, got, I've got my uh, cup of tea right here. Thank Me you. Too. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cup of tea. There you go. So... Anyway, uh, and we're working on that problem, by the way, because unfortunately, cancer cells indeed can get to the brain and there can be brain metastases. Mm -hmm. So the chemotherapy is, is treating the whole body. The other way of treating the whole body is with anti-estrogen pills. Wendy, you're on one right now called tamoxifen, which is what we use in premenopausal women. And you're having, I'm sure, menopausal symptoms that we can it's talk about about yeah. that in a few minutes. And, and Wendy calls it her tamoxa sexy. I do, because I so don't we'll want to take it. we'll get into that in a moment. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, then in postmenopausal women is a category of anti-estrogen pills called aromatase inhibitors. So, Todd, the chemotherapies have become, to use an old political line, a kinder and gentler, uh, but unfortunately they're still toxic. Unfortunately, uh, the key uh, agents like adriamycin, as a good example, does cause hair loss. Uh, you know, it's probably one of the side effects women fear the most is losing all of their hair, literally. Uh, their their uh, eyebrows, their eyelashes, uh, hair on their head, uh, you know, etc. Uh, you have in the Taxol family, uh, one of the real side effects is called peripheral neuropathy. Uh, where you get numbness in your fingers and toes. Uh, a lot of the taxols cause a darkening of the finger, uh, fingernails and toenails. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, a lot of these things are, in fact, uh, a toxic, and nobody likes them. And the thing, one of the things we worry about the most is uh, not only are we trying to harm cancer cells, but we harm good cells. Like our, in our bone marrow, we're harming the production of white cells, red cells, platelets, things of this sort. And uh, so it is, it, it, we're poisoning people, quite frankly, is what we're doing, but we're doing it in a little bit better way, certainly safer than when I started to be really focused on all this about 28 years ago. And I, I will have to applaud the University of Arizona Integrative Medicine Studies that you can take a course online of breast cancer, of education of what the doctors are finding through the research, of, of treating the whole person with the chemo or with the tamoxifen, but also with supplements that help build and rebuild the immune system. And I will have to share this supplement that was given to me, Indole 3 Carbonyl, <laughs> that was the University of Arizona was talking about. It's in it's what's in the cabbage family and those cruciferous vegetables, and it has anti-tumor producing benefits to it. But it also helps with the PMS and the menopausal symptoms of the heat in my body and the grogginess. It took away my morning grogginess, and I only get the heat when my body's ready to cycle. And I tell you, it just really helped balance out my system because it's supporting what the tamoxifen, it's making the tamoxifen more effective, but also it's making my body, my immune system, working with the tamoxifen so it's not, it doesn't feel like a burden as much as it could have. Well, hey, uh, outstanding point, and I think, Wendy, next month you and I are actually going to go through that course uh, that the University of Arizona Integrative Medicine Department has. It's spectacular. The one thing, though, that since you bring this up, uh, patients are desperate. Uh, at this time when, with a diagnosis of breast cancer. So they're online, they're reading all sorts of stuff, and they're finding some stuff that's good, and they're finding some stuff that's bad. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's doing any kind of supplements, if you will, 
needs to inform their medical oncologist that they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Some things, particularly if you're on chemotherapy, may actually mitigate or lessen the effectiveness of the chemotherapy. Right. Uh, and some of the herbs and some of the other things that are out there. I mean, people are desperate. They're taking all sorts of stuff. And bottom line is we really want the chemo to, to work. Uh, but you betcha, things that are going to help with menopausal symptoms, like you suggested, is absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely fantastic. Now, what one other, the, Todd, let me just what? jump in. One other thing while I'm thinking about it. Chemo, the typical chemotherapies that we give now, in effect, are poisons, okay? They're t I, w I wish they were more uh, targeted, but they are, and they're good, and they work. We, that's the one thing. I don't want people to think, oh, gosh, I'm going to take chemo, and it doesn't work. It does work. Is it a guarantee? No, but it does work. Drugs like Herceptin, Todd and Wendy, are uh, made from uh, through a process using monoclonal antibodies, in other words, it's going after the specific, the specific HER2 new target on cancer cells. And that's what I was saying a few minutes ago. When we get down to these genomic profiles of these cancers, what's going to come out of this are going to be a series of targets that we can make biologics for and not necessarily poisons for. Does that make sense, I hope? Yeah, it's, we're definitely, you know, we're still in the infancy of where this is headed, even though we feel very modern and high-tech, we'll look back in 29 or 28 years from oh. now and look back at this time and recognize its infancy. Oh, absolutely. And one of the ultimate drugs is TDM1, the, you know, the smart, smart bomb. bomb. Remember, mm -hmm. we did, we've, got some, we've got some videos at Breast Cancer Answers on TDM1, and there the concept is a super cool concept. So what you do is you take this monoclonal antibody produced uh, agent and within it is a super toxic bomb, mm -hmm. if you will. So it attaches then to just the specific cancer cells, mm -hmm. not all the cells in the body. Once it attaches to the specific targeted cancer cells, it, it goes off, if you will. It releases the super toxic stuff just theoretically to the cancer cells and not to the whole body. Now, Dr. Harness, we did a story um, with you the day that the TDM1 news broke, and I think it's been roughly about a year since we did that story. How long does it take for a smart bomb drug that's kind of a revolution in cancer fighting to make its way from a splash on the news and something exciting to actually being in the hands of medical oncologists treating patients? Well, TDM1 uh, is approved actually for stage 4 breast cancer in, the, in HER2 new positive patients. So it's actually being used right now. What we in the field are after is the approval of TDM1 in what's called the neoadjuvant setting, the upfront chemotherapy setting. Uh, and it, Todd, I think we're close to that. It generally takes a year or so experience at, and again, a lot of these drugs come in initially in the stage four, you know, patients who are really desperate. I mean, they're not going to survive without something like this. And then it goes to the next level. And one of the next levels is to use it up front in well, called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then if it works there, because you see, the point is we can see rapidly if it's working because you've got the tumor in the person, you give the chemo, and if it starts melting away dramatically, you know that it's working. Then a drug like TDM1 will then go to the next level called adjuvant, meaning after surgery in, let's say, HER2 new positive uh, patients. So the process is going on. TDM1 is now being used and has been for months uh, in stage 4 breast cancer patients. We're all waiting for it hopefully soon to be in the neoadjuvant setting. Wendy, do you mind if I ask a couple questions about the, the chemo cycle or the, you know, how, can, Dr. Harness, can you explain that to us? Um, a, a patient starts and their regimen is different depending on what their condition is. Kind of walk us through big picture mm -hmm. and give us an overview which really plays out into the big question of do I need chemo and all right. those things like we're talking about today. 
Right. You know, there are different established regimens right now. Uh, a good one is called AC, uh, adriamycin cytoxin. And then there's a, a subcategory of that called dose dense, meaning increasing the dose and shortening the time. But the typical chemo cycle, Todd, uh, generally it's anywhere from four on up to six cycles, usually done every three weeks. Uh, in other words, you're going to give the poison and then you've got to let the poor patient recover, basically. And you want those normal functions to cover, especially the bone marrow functions, to cover and the ability to fight infection to recover. And there are drugs we can give that can boost the bone marrow to uh, kick out more white cells, etc. One of the side effects we all worry about from chemo is that the white count gets so low mm -hmm. that the simplest of things could be very toxic to a patient, you know, like a cold or a virus or whatever. Uh, but it's things like that. So typically, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy or even neoadjuvant chemotherapy is a minimum usually of four cycles, sometimes up to uh, uh, six cycles. Generally, within the first two or three cycles, if you're doing it up front, you can see whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. And there are actually new uh, research programs going on where you use breast MRI and do a scan each after each cycle of chemo to see if that particular regimen is working uh, by the changes going on in, uh, at the cancer level. And this is again up front chemo and if it's not changing to a different regimen. So mm -hmm. in general it's about four months there are certain protocols that it could run a lot longer, but in general, roughly four, a little under four months, once every three weeks. And then that cycle uh, also can interrupt a reconstruction period, right? So uh, it, it then the reconstruction would happen after the chemo cycles. Well, uh, let's use Wendy as a good example. Wendy underwent bilateral mastectomies and at the time of her mastectomies had tissue expanders put in. Very, very common. She also had lymph nodes removed because of two of them were positive. All, all very, very standard. Let's assume hypothetically that in fact she was going to get chemotherapy. The, what the plastic surgeon would do is wait until the nadir is over. In other words, if it's every three weeks, usually by the end of the second week or the beginning of the third week, before you get your next cycle of chemo, you're rebounding back up. Your white count's coming back up, etc. The plastic surgeon will use that window of opportunity to inject and expand the expanders when the white count is rebounding back up, not when it's you know super low, because what the plastic surgeon is worried about is inadvertently causing an infection by sticking a needle into the ports that are in the tissue expanders. And, and so, yes, you can expand people during chemo. Uh, the plastic surgeons also worry about infection around the implants because of the white counts being lowered by the chemo. You know, we circulate bacteria in our body, Todd, all the time. We can brush our teeth. There are all sorts of things we can do that can circulate bacteria. So the plastic surgeon is always a little uptight if the patient is getting chemo while the tissue expanders are there. But in, in general, it works pretty well most of the time. Now, we've got only got time for uh, two questions left. Okay. And so Wendy and I are going to each ask a remaining question that's on our mind about chemo. And I'll go first, Wendy, if you don't mind. Um, Dr. Harness, I made the mistake when Wendy and I went to the medical visit with the medical oncologist. This is before we knew our Oncotype DX test score and before we knew that Wendy wouldn't benefit from chemo and that her cancer wasn't that aggressive. I made the mistake of going on a tour with Wendy and recommending we see the, what is it, the infusion center? Or? I think I made the suggestion because I, I wanted to see. I wanted to see what goes on, but it also looks like an IV center where people go to get vitamin C IVs and B12 and such. So it it plays a very similar, you know, it looks very similar. Except, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Wendy, Right. everybody in there looked significantly sicker than we could have imagined. Right. Uh, how do you, for patients that can benefit from chemo, how do you mitigate that terror that they experience, and is that possible? 
Uh, yeah, I think it is, Todd. I mean, it, it, you, you bring up an interesting point. At our cancer center, we have individual infusion rooms, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have uh, rooms where you can get like four, four people or more in there. Right. And it's really interesting. When we moved into the new cancer center, the prior settings were all a big room where everybody got, they're all sitting around basically in a circle, and the patients actually started complaining about going into the individual rooms because they miss seeing their friend Susie or Sally or whatever. In other words, there is an element. You're right. It is scary. I mean, there's nothing fun about any of this. But they also, and somebody's throwing up over there or you know, looks as white as a sheet or whatever. On the other hand, what was going on was a lot of bonding among the patients because, in effect, they were all in the same lifeboat together. And, and so it's, it was fascinating. We started getting complaints from patients. Well, I miss being with the other ladies. So again, there's no perfect solution for this. And especially on the front end, uh, coming in and say, hey, gee, what's this like? And you take one look, you say, I don't want to be on this boat at all, you know? Yeah. But it, uh, it's amazing the human soul and the human spirit, the way people adopt. And most all the people who work in infusion centers are really compassionate, and the patients who are there, and then there are support groups that can help you get through this as well. Well said. In the closing moments, Wendy Hartley, your last question to Dr. Harness about the topic at hand, do I really need chemo? Actually, it's, and I think Dr. Harney, he's so thorough with everything that he answers. It's more of a statement for the women that go through chemo and the beauty that they can be out in public with their scarves and not have to wear wigs and to, to be able to just interact like a normal person. I applaud that because I don't know if I would have had the strength to be able to be in my operating day to do my to do the things I needed to do and reveal to everyone that I'm going through cancer. And I just, you know, they're they're remarkable women and uh, I think God gives us what we can handle. Well said, Wendy. Very, very well said. I want to really emphasize this my patients are remarkable women. Okay, they truly are. And I got a few guys that I take care of too. Believe it or not, as we know, men can get uh, breast cancer and men will go through chemotherapy and men will take tamoxifen and have the same treatments. But my hat goes off and I honor deeply all of my patients. Mm -hmm. They are truly remarkable. Speaking of remarkable, on with me is Dr. Jay Harness, past president of the American Society of Breast Surgeons. Dr. Harness and I are going to be at the American Society, whoa, that's the wrong conference, the San Antonio <laughs> Breast Cancer Symposium. And every day in December, uh, oh, during that conference, we're going to be giving you a daily update on the latest news and information coming out of San Antonio. And the other remarkable is Wendy Hartley, our breast cancer survivor, the love of my life, and watching you, Wendy, go through your cancer fight was nothing short of inspiring. You inspire me every day. The two of you are very, very impressive, and I'm honored to get to spend time with you. So on behalf of Dr. Jay Harness and Wendy Hartley, we wish all of you very, very happy, healthy recovery of wherever you are, and whatever issues you're dealing with. Any questions that may come, please feel free to add it at breastcanceranswers.com. We use that information to help develop where our content creation is headed. So if you see a deficiency in our content, please let us know. We are listening and we look forward to continuing to provide better, more accurate, and really more timely information that's all addressed specifically to the layperson or as I guess we would say, to the patient and their loved one. So have a wonderful day. We'll look forward to talking with you real soon. Coming up in November, Dr. Harness and Wendy are going to be talking about the course that they're taking from the Center of Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona, and they're taking a breast cancer integrative course together. And Wendy is going to be asking Dr. Harness questions that she's discovering along the way. The two, of you, the two of them will collaborate for your benefit, and that'll happen right here at Breast Cancer Answers.